Hey guys, Savage Joy here with Real Progressives. Um, tonight I am joined by Miss Bonnie Wright. Um, she is a candidate in New Hampshire um, for state rep in Rockingham 8. Um, so thank you so much for joining us tonight, Bonnie. You were recommended uh, by Drea, uh, one of my Bernie friends. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's not too often that I get to um, interview people with with such a, a passion for organic foods and uh, things like that. So that's probably a good place to start. What um, it it states that your page says that you started a grassroots organization to support a New Hampshire bill which labels genetically engineered foods. Mm -hmm. um, so do you want to kind of start there and, and explain why you got into that? Well, sure. Um, thanks for having me, first of all. Absolutely. Uh, in 2013, I was trying to learn more about gene GMOs, genetically modified organisms. And I found out that there was going to be an event in our state capital, Concord, New Hampshire. And we, I went to that, bill, that event. I actually ended up somehow or other getting talked into being a speaker. Stood on the state capital steps with my knees shaking in front of about 500 people for March Against Monsanto. And we had um, a state rep that was talking about a bill she had introduced, but there was no grassroots group to support it. And I have organized other groups, and I said, oh, that would be easy. I can do that. It doesn't matter that I don't know anything about politics. <laughs> um, didn't really quite realize what I was getting myself into, which is probably a good thing, or I wouldn't have done it. Um, but... I started connecting with people who were concerned about GMOs. And as I met them and learned more and more about them, I learned that they had a lot of other issues that I was one of those people. I had my head buried in the sand. I wanted to ignore politics because it was too complex and too boring. And I didn't know enough to get involved. So I just ignored it totally. So in the process of working on legislation for this bill, I started learning about a lot of other issues. And I, the more people I connected with, the more I learned and the more I said, this isn't, we have a lot of problems here. This is not good. Um, and that was really what opened my eyes when I watched how our state reps told us on this group that I founded. We ended up with over 2000 followers and we, um, inundated the state capitol in 2014. It was the, the state reps were saying, Bonnie, stop having them call me because we got too many calls. Um, it had been up to that point, the bill that had more calls than any other call to date. I suspect the way things have gone in the last couple of years that, that those numbers have probably changed, but um, we had a lot of people calling in and um, the state rep said, yeah, we, I, I know what my constituents want, but I know what they should be wanting. And when I heard that, it was like fires went off. I was so angry at that state rep who actually could say that my constituents don't know what they want. Um, so I got more and more involved and people kept saying, Bonnie, if you want to fix things, if you want to change things, you got to do it from the inside. And so that was one of the things that made me start to think about running for office. Um, so we got a good group going and, you know, it's kind of fizzled out because of the um, federal government taking over the GMO labeling. And um, so, it, you know, but we, we gave it a good try. Um, Absolutely. That's pretty amazing because, uh, you know, it only takes one person as trite as it sounds. It really does. Once, once you have that platform, um, it's, you know, it's just so much easier to, um, 
you know, educate people and to get them involved. Um, you actually, I, I have yet to be to New Hampshire, but um, from the, the candidates I've interviewed and everything, it does seem like there is um, uh, quite a bit of farmland. There's some, there's not, um, our, our farms are shrinking. Um, they're mostly small farms. We don't have any of the really big farms that um, we have out west, but, um, you know, it's, it's a struggle. Land is becoming more and more valuable, and the farmers are realizing that they can sell their property and make a good profit and not have to work. So, um, you know, in the town I live in, there's almost no land left. Um, and what little land we do have left, there's a lot of arguments over what we should do with it. I'm vice chair of our zoning board, so that makes it a, a bit of a challenge to try and keep people happy there. But we don't have, I think we have two farms left in town and they're small. Wow. You also stated um, on your platform, um, on, on one of the links on your platform, um, you talked about saving bees. Um, this is not talked about enough. Um, can, from your perspective, can you explain why you're passionate about that and why it's so important um, that we are more cognizant of that? Well, you, you got to have bees to have food. I mean, the bees pollinate the food. Um, the bees are dying like crazy. And there's questions as to what is the exact cause for them to be dropping off. But um, probably one of the causes is the neonicotinoids, which is one of the um, processes that's used with genetically engineered seeds. Um, they're coated in this chemical to um, kill the pest. It gets into the plant system and stays in there. And then the expectation is that the bees get into the plants and um, then they carry things back to the hive and the whole hives die. We have a lot of hive die off. So if we don't have the bees to pollinate our food, we're not going to have food. Right. Wow. Um, you, uh, this kind of, uh, digressing a little, but you do have, um, environment on your platform, which is, you know, there's of course a lot of different aspects of that um what what is one of your main focal points in that regard i got several um i'm concerned about the pipelines that we've had i'm a very strong passionate um advocate for solar panels in the solar industry um i have um my don't get jealous but my electric bill in my home is um all of $14 and change because I have solar panels that produce all of the electricity that we need. Um, then um, I've been very passionate about some of the pesticide issues. Um, I try to eat as much as I can organic. It's very hard, especially if you go out to stick with that. But as much as I can, um, we try to keep organic foods in our home. Um, that's easier for me than some because I am president of the Salem, New Hampshire farmer's market. So I go to the market and, and I know who to get my food from there. Um, but, um, I worked on a, the last several GMO bills that we had. Um, I actually had the last one written and was introduced by one of my state. It was written by a, one of the NGOs in DC, um, right after the Vermont bill, this was the Center for Food Safety helped me with that. And they wrote it right after the Vermont hearing on their bill. So it was, we had the best bill in the country. Um, and then I made one little change with their permission and um, my town rep introduced the bill for me. Then he kind of got nervous and he backed out one, he only had one co-sponsor and that co-sponsor took the bill and ran with it. And he added another co-sponsor, which was Jim McConnell. And so when I, I ran for state rep in 2016, 
And when I lost, Jim contacted me and said, you know, really sorry you lost. Um, do you have a bill that you'd like to introduce? I said, I don't have one right now, but I can come up with one. So the good folks at Beyond Pesticides helped me put together a bill. Um, I looked at it and said, it's good. It's to reduce the use of pesticides where children play, but we don't, we're not covering athletic fields. And I had seen a picture of my grandkids doing push-ups on a soccer field, putting their face two inches away from the grass. And I said, can we include that? Maybe something like this. And I gave them the two parts of it for that bill that I thought maybe would be the way to go. And they said, that's great. And because it was more complex than parts of the other, I wrote about half of that bill. Um, so then the Libertarian Republican state rep introduced it for me. We worked together on a very bipartisan way. Um, I helped get the Democratic uh, state reps. He got the Republicans and we had a very strong bill. Um, unfortunately, we had a lot of opposition from companies like the lobbyists from Monsanto came and testified. We had some really big, powerful people that were at our hearings. Um, so when we finished, the, it got carried over the summer. They had a bunch of workshops last early fall, and they came back and said, this is inex what New Hampshire calls inexpedient to legislate, ITL, which means they recommended to kill the bill. Every bill in New Hampshire goes to the House floor. So it had to go to the House floor with the recommendation that it was a bad bill. And the House agreed. The Environment and Ag Committee said that this was a bad bill because it was preempting the rights of communities to pass a law. It should be decided on the, on the local level. What really infuriated me was a week before they made that decision, the new bills for the next session were introduced. The vice chair of that committee introduced another bill. And that bill was to preempt the local regulation of seeds and fertilizers. They were taking those rights away from the communities and giving it to the state. So I went and I testified on HB uh, 1233, the second one, and said, wait a minute, you can't, you do, you can't, have it both ways. And I heard a whole lot of ruffling behind me from the audience um, indicating, yes, they agreed with me. Unfortunately, this was a Senate bill. Um, actually, it had passed the House. This was in the Senate. And the Senate said, no, we're going we're gonna to move ahead. And we're going to take the same rights. You know, you have Pesticides with children play that you can't do on the local level has to be decided on the state level. And am I getting that right? Can't be done on the state level, has to be done on the local level. But you've got other chemicals that are being used on lawns and grass that can't be controlled by the town, has to be controlled by the state. It was insane. So, wow. <laughs> and it always comes to money. That's and, always what it comes down to. Yeah. Um, the opposition did a great job on both bills. I got to say they did a fantastic job. Um, they did things that counteracted what my experts were saying because I helped get some of our experts to talk. And um, it, it was bad. It was just, they lied. <laughs> they lied. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. And, and, you know, speaking of money and how these things like, you know, it seems like that's always what everything comes back to. You do on your platform, you do have um, getting money out of politics and gerrymandering. Um, I'm in Pennsylvania, so we're pretty much the gerrymandering, uh, you know, capital. Uh, so, why are those things important? Why did you put those on your platform? Well, when you look at the what happened with the GMO bills, what happened with the pesticide fertilizer bills, it all came down to money. 
if we don't get money out of politics, it's gonna, things like that are gonna continue to happen. If we can't fix the districting and make the districting fair, let the people pick the politicians, not the politicians pick the people, then we're, we, it's, the two work hand in hand. Um, and we gotta fix both of them. And we gotta do it soon. Um, that's why 2020 is going to be enormous because of the census, um, making sure that um, the right party is in charge of, which would be the left party, in charge of the um, gerrymandering. Um, I don't know if it's everywhere, but I know in New Hampshire, our districts are, are decided in 2020. Do you think that the Democrats would vote in in favor of uh, you know getting rid of gerrymandering? Um, I think that I, I know the person who is hoping to be the Secretary of State here in New Hampshire. Um, he's been meeting with progressive candidates to try and help encourage them to run to do better, um, and also when they get elected to support him. He wants to do a nonpartisan um, redistricting. To me, I like his attitude. Um, it has to be done so it's fair to everyone. As much as I would like the left to have more control, I, I think it needs to be just done on a, there's a way to do it numerically to be fair to everybody. And that's what we have to do. Yeah, agreed. I mean, it is, I know when they were doing ours, I'm like, that's tempting. Maybe they should just kind of move that line a little to the left. But no, you're you're right. It's it it goes totally goes both ways. Um what are how many other people are you running against? <laughs> New Hampshire is bizarre. We have the third largest English speaking legislative body in the entire world. Um, so only the U.S. Parliament, uh, U.S. Um, Congress and Parli English Parliament have more members than we do. We have 400 state reps. We wow. have one rep for about 3,000 people. So my town of 30,000 has right now nine, because we've grown in the last 10 years, we have nine state reps. Oh my so, gosh. Um, so we have, I'm, I'm running as a Democrat. We have 10 Democrats running for nine seats. We have 12 Republicans running for nine seats. So September 11th, we will have primaries. Um, and then um, the final election will be November 11th, uh, November 6th. And are you open primaries in New Hampshire? Yes, so awesome. um, so undeclared is what they're called here, um, can go in, they have to go in, they register as a party the day of election or before, but they can do it, the, when they walk in, they can change their party, say I wanna vote as a Democrat or I wanna vote as a Republican, take the appropriate ballot, go in and vote. They can come back out and say, okay, switch me back. Um, but for at least five minutes, they have to belong to one of the parties. Um, that was That's big... really advantageous. We are completely closed primary here, and it's quite uh, frustrating. You have to change and be that party for at least 30 days. Um, so it's, you know, and, and half the time, people don't even know the candidates that far in advance. Um, yeah, that's that's frustrating. As far as um, uh, voter, um, uh, what do you want to see as far as um, all of the um, election uh, rigging and everything we saw against Bernie in 2016? What can we do um, now? Do you support paper ballots? Um, what what do you think we can do? Um, even starting with your state? Um, I'm very concerned about the election process and um, that the rigging of 
um, you know, one of our se our senior senator just got her um, account hacked. Um, so, and we just heard that Claire McCaskill just got hacked. So I'm concerned of that they have the potential of going in and changing whatever they want to and making sure the right person wins. Um, uh, that was part of your question. I only answered half of it and I don't remember the other half. Well, that that was uh, um, something that we dealt with a lot uh, working for Bernie's campaign. A lot of people were um, being switched parties without ever asking and it was closed primaries. So they would be registered Democrat for 30 years. They'd show up and they'd say, you're a Republican, you can't vote for him. Oh. Because someone was switching. I mean, this they are literally, I mean, by the thousands, people were coming out with this. Um, and, and there's videos of it on YouTube and everything. And that's, it's, um, and these are, you know, these are just primaries. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that, that goes on that's kind of daunting. Um, so um, would you like to see open primaries across the country? I would. Um, I, I don't think people need to be pigeonholed into a party. Um, and, you know, I've been talking with a lot of people who, you know, they don't fully support, they always vote Democrat, but they don't support some of the platform policies. Um, or they might have some issues that they don't agree with the Democrats, but they lean towards Republican. Um, or they don't agree with the Democrats because the Democrats aren't far enough along. Don't make, don't pigeonhole people into one thing. Let them do what they want. Um, right. Person over party. Absolutely. I'm a, a very proud independent. And independents are actually the biggest voting block now. I think there's 43% of us. So by making closed primaries, the Dems are actually losing votes because the biggest part of independents are those who lean to the Dems. Um, so it would really be advantageous for you know everyone in that regard. Um, so. I'm sorry, did you want to say something else? No, no. Oh, okay. Um, you do talk about um, a living wage. What um, in your district does that mean to you? What is there a, a number you're thinking?